everybody, I'm David Baldwin, and welcome to If You Only Read Six Books, Read These Damn Books. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the belief, oh, it got into my background, the belief economy, how to uh, stop selling, give a damn, and create buy-in. Uh, and uh, with me are my fellow off authors, uh, Cameron Day, Nancy Vonk, Luke Sullivan, and Thomas Kemeny, who you hopefully have already seen their videos because they're very helpful to starting your career. So let's go. Ask me some questions. Uh, well, first I have a statement, which is, I love that the belief economy basically makes the case that advertising is on track to be known as a profession that's largely about uncovering a brand's purpose. And it's clearly a really brilliant read for clients. I also was really struck that it's a book that should be in ad professionals' hands right for, you know, starting with kids right out of school. Um, the youngest generations, Gen Z, millennials, are they hold their values above their paycheck. So you know, it's a it's a good news book for them. It's you have picked, you have come to the right place. You've picked a great career. You're you're so passionate about this. When did this become a big thing to you? At what point did you decide you really wanted to bear down on and and design your agency eventually around this kind of focus on purpose? Well, you know, first of all, I love advertising and I've loved this career. It has been an absolutely great career and I love selling. Um, at the same time, when I had children, I wouldn't let them watch advertising. I just didn't let them do it. I was like, I don't want that in there because I watched kids advertising at the time. And I went, what the hell is going on here with these? You know, so um, I used to make them mute. If they were watching TV, I would make them mute the TV and bring up a guide, you know, over the over the screen. And we called it mute and guide, which was a very funny thing. Um, but I, I think, you know, I want to answer this a little differently because I think that there's a feeling that if you're into um, this idea of purpose and creating value for people that you don't believe in selling. And and that is something I hear all the time. It's something that I got whacked with a baseball bat when I wrote this book of, oh, you don't but you've forgotten the the Ogilvy maxim of seller else. No, I haven't. I think David Ogilvy would absolutely ac actually be one of the leaders in this. Um, and I think Dove is a great example of that, right? I mean, if there is a, a campaign that showed the industry how to do it, it was Dove and it was Ogilvy. So that said, I love this business, um, but I think that as people, we need to look at the impact that we have everywhere. And um, I think our industry can actually, uh, we wield an incredible amount of economic force. And for youngsters getting into this business, in seven years, you're going to be in charge. Wow, in seven really years, good. you will be in charge. So you caring makes a huge difference. And you giving your own damn makes a huge difference. And you can make advertising um, something that sells products, employs people, makes the economy stronger, uh, creates middle class jobs, creates factories, creates all sorts of things uh, and has an effect everywhere and that to me that's a noble profession so now on top of that if you can help clients understand that they can create value with what they do and you can create value in the work you do um, it creates a win-win for everybody cool david um in the belief economy uh, you wrote give a damn about what's in front of you the job you're working on your families and the impact your work will have on the culture on the world uh, which I see engraved in the wall, in the virtual wall of your real agency, uh, right behind you. Yep. Uh, so it's clearly in your blood. It's not just in your book. Uh, you used one of your own clients as an example, uh, Burt's Bees. Uh, is there a particular campaign that represents how a brand might leverage shared beliefs uh, on behalf of doing good? Well, I, I want to refocus the notion of doing good a little bit and instead talk about creating value, uh, creating value in people's lives. I think it is a little bit different. And I think doing good is really uh, important for brands that uh, need to do good. But I think what every company does is create a value proposition for people in their lives or in the world. And that's where your purpose lives is what what is that belief system that you're uh, that, that you're operating from. And, and I think what's really important is 
before you get to the advertising, you actually need to talk about the, the belief system and, and whatever that purpose is within your company, because it should actually live within your company first, and it should actually drive the company forward. And if you think of a brand as a set of behaviors based on a belief system, um, the, some of those behaviors are advertising and design. So if you don't have that initial purpose or you don't have that initial belief system mission codified and articulated, it can get really hard. So the reason I used Burt's Bees as an example is they're doing a lot of work with that client. The, the uh, belief system of that company is to be nature's champion. And it makes it really easy because you say, all right, well, hey, we have to do a coupon because we want to give away, we want to drive trial for a, a skincare. So when you come from Nature's Champion, what's the Nature's Champion coup coupon, right? That coupon was a billboard that we created that actually was a before and after billboard where you could pull off the coupons, which were recyclable coupons, um, then use that as a uh, to reveal the, the after image. Uh, and then uh, from there, that billboard then got repurposed as a water catchment uh, system at a local school in Durham because they're very committed to local gardens. Purpose and it's still there. It's still there to this day. Great. Purpose was baked into the whole idea. It, it, it preceded it. And, right. and right. it makes it so that you can't do just normal crappy advertising. You can't, you, you can't, or you're not living into being nature's champion. That's a really interesting point you bring up because I have a friend who teaches and yeah. the head of the advertising program only wants to do purpose-driven advertising. And it actually frustrates my friend for, who's an instructor because he said, you know, there are some brands that really don't have a purpose and still need to advertise. So he tries to balance that out as the kids build the books because he doesn't want the books to look just entirely like it's just a do-gooder book. Does that even make sense? It yeah. totally does. In fact, I just wrote an article uh, for Branding Magazine about this, looking at purpose as big P, little P. Like some brands don't have a big P purpose of saving whales. A brand might have, their purpose might be, we want to inspire confidence. But you know, if I'm, I'm making this up, but if I'm working on Mitchum deodorant, their purpose is probably really dry armpits, you know? And okay. so what's the emotional, out there's always going to be an emotional outcome from that. There's going to be a rational outcome from that. And now, now I've got my purpose. My purpose is to, I'm making this up. I don't, I'm not putting this on Mitchum, Mitchum people watching. Uh, the purpose might be, we want to help people be more confident in their social interactions. That's an awesome purpose. That's not sell. That's not saving the whales. It is doing some good. It's making people more confident in their social interaction. Well, and, and I think to your point, you can show a client like that, how they can lean towards a purpose, like stop using plastics in your products, or right. you, you can kind of lead them down the path to making good decisions. But I think oftentimes that's where the opportunity really lies within a traditional ad agency. Yeah. And I'm really fascinated by, I'd love Nancy, I'd actually love Nancy to comment on this because I think she had a front row seat to it, but I'm fascinated by also having marketing and advertising possibly lead that effort within an organization and help change the organization backwards. And I'm going to ask this question because I have a sort of theory that Paul Pullman and Dove happened sort of concurrently uh, because Paul Pullman, who was the former CEO of Unilever, made uh, a declaration that all the Unilever brands would be have a, a bigger social purpose and mission. Um, and all of those brands lead the other non-purpose brands in sales by something like 68%. Um, oh, wow. Nancy, what's your take on that? Am I, am I right? Oh, uh, you know, I worked on Unilever brands for ever. Uh, and absolutely that there's, there's uh, their culture, their, their purpose driven uh, kind of way of seeing the world had everything to do with um, the space being there to create a, a, a campaign of campaign for for real beauty. I do sense you can drill down into practically any brand yeah. and find something there that the brand could put a stake in the ground for that's that does connect. And if it doesn't connect to the brand, well, you've got fa a failed that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Your purpose can't exceed your grasp. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I'll, the example that I would use, and I apologize to Gillette because I have not seen their internal documents and I don't know uh, what I'm saying literally here, but what I see from the outside is trying to take on toxic masculinity in a company that hadn't taken it on internally. They took it on in their marketing and they got, they got crucified for it at, you know, at the beginning. I still think they've done some phenomenal work around it. 
Um, but they didn't look at the regular company. Why does why is the ladies razor? Uh, why is a woman's razor more expensive than a man man's razor? And then you're talking about toxic masculinity. You didn't do the work first internally to transform your company to which the marketing is then an output versus, uh, um, you know, what is what has been deemed good washing or green washing, which so many clients do. If you look at your brand, if you look at the word brand as a verb instead of a noun, uh, it, it helps you start to think about actions, not words. The words come after the actions. You say what you did and what you're doing, not uh, what you're gonna do and, and BSing the story. Now I notice on Thomas's wall, that sign has been there throughout the series. You'll think of something. I trust you've thought of a question, young Thomas. <laughs> I have and I actually, uh, maybe I'll go to my second question. Um, I think it's it's easy to see sort of snarky comments online about a brand that's trying to do something good, um, and immediately everyone descends on them and says, "Oh, they you know did this thing that goes against what they just said." Um, do you think there's maybe this thought of oh you can't win? Why even bother? Why even bother trying to do good as a company um, or as a brand? What what do you say to that? I say it's deserved in most uh, situations, not all for sure. But um, I also think that it's a journey. Uh, adding value is a journey that a company can get on and let's not kill them for trying. Uh, let's not kill them for trying. But I do think we need to call out the ones who are bullshitting us. I had a, um, a question pop up reading your, reading your book. Okay, so say you're uh, in the room when a client is pushing, yeah. who has declared a purpose, uh, we, we have, um, a strong notion of what it means to walk the walk and yet the client might say oh my god sales are down i think we need to do blah 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 which is actually maybe even for the youngest creative in the room what they're saying is in conflict with that stated purpose yeah what what are your thoughts on what somebody without a big title at the table though in that meeting how might how might you respond if if you're thinking whoa that's 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 really not aligned with what we're saying we we stand for i would argue that maybe the young person in the room doesn't have enough context to understand the decision and so it might make sense to try to get clarity around that while you're doing the work that's being asked to make sure and and see what the track record for the company is so that you're not being the shrill person saying hey this isn't right I'll give you an example from my own company. We, we have give a damn as our purpose, our charge, like this is what leads our, our, our whole company. We use it when we give employer reviews. It's like, how much did you give a damn? Are you a damn giver? You know, it, it, it lives everywhere. However, one of our other, um, one of our other um, charters is don't do anything just for the money. So sometimes those two things come into conflict because I give a damn about the people that I work with and we have another one called people first always, right? So give a damn people first always, don't do anything just for the money. Sometimes those come into conflict mm -hmm. because I don't wanna lay the people off that I love working with, that I've hired, that I've brought into this journey. So what we do is we're super transparent about it at the time that we're asking people to do that. And we will say, this is what this is. This is why we're doing it because it's gonna, it's gonna serve the greater value and the greater good that we're trying to do. So I, I think um, as a, a youngster coming into the business, like try to get a sense of the people you work for and whether they mean it and all of those things. And again, start to vote with your, your wallet and your, your billable hours in the, uh, in the conversation and give it some time and see, wow. see where the company lives. Well, I was about to say this may also mean voting with your job uh, occasionally. Um, I was a chief creative officer at an agency uh, where during a new business lull, uh, when I was on vacation, the new business team uh, answered a, a, a call to pitch for the business of a, um, a chewing tobacco. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when I got back from vacation for a little, for a minute, I kind of thought, oh, great, it's a new business, but it didn't take me an hour to go, we're selling cancer. Yeah. Uh, I, I brought that up at the board meeting and six months later I was out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's a pretty easy call. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it. Well, and I, I will say this too. I think uh, Bill Bernbach 
said, you know, uh, uh, I always mess this up, but basically a principal isn't a principal until it costs you money. Bravo. I've made so many decisions not to make money in my career based on my own value set. And I'm super comfortable with it. I, some people aren't. I am. David, I've got one for you. Yeah. What would you tell young creatives about how to go about vetting um, a company they're thinking about going to work for? Oh, I love that question. Okay, so there's a very simple way to do this for every company, and it's to look at the work and the output. That's it. Stop listening to what they say other than what, they, what the output is. You want to, every agency on this planet says, we believe in creativity, and 5% of them do it. Right. So go look at the smallest agency in the smallest town. They literally say what McCann says. Right. They say, we believe in the power of ideas. Uh, if you look at the output of any company, you'll actually see whether they're uh, taking it seriously. And if you look another at the version, work, another version of brand is behavior. It's exactly right. You look at the actions in con in concert with the words. Uh, do the actions match? How can a junior person help steer a big ass company? I would look at it. I would love all your takes on this too, but I would look at it as an aggregate. Are you having doing more good than you're doing bad? If you're working at a place that doesn't care, it's toxic. What the hell are you doing there anyway? Why are you there? You know, now, if you don't care, that's fine. That's you. If you don't, if you don't care about what a company does and you're living in the um, kind of world of the invisible free hand of the market and um, it's all about the shareholders, that's, that's up to you. That's fine. That's not where I am. But I think um, if you are wired around conscience and you believe in selling, we sell things for a living. That's what we do. We sell. Um, and so you have to, you have to um, as a young person, you have to wrestle with that because it's not an easy necessarily conversation. I wrestle with it to this day all the time. Thomas, you're our resident young person. <laughs> Have you have you ever have you ever have you ever had to deal with the, the issues we're talking about here in your jobs? You worked at some very cool progressive agencies, so maybe maybe not. I've I've been very fortunate that I haven't dealt with it much, um, but there were you know there were times where um, you know I've been on a freelance project or something and, and get put on something and you know don't don't love the company or don't love what they're doing and and i think it's been nice to be able to say i don't want to work on this anymore and step away it's sort of like you also want to give brands a chance i think to to david's point like i, I don't want to work on a cigarette company i'm not gonna work for a cigarette company but um but you know sometimes you have big company big organizations that just are actually really decent companies and you don't know it because they've just done such a terrible job of, of branding themselves and you know they're sort of the you know, some brand has, has pegged them as the Goliath that everyone needs to fight. And then you go and you start talking to these people and you're like, oh my God, these people are like such wonderful, kind people who actually care and like look at what they actually are doing in the world that nobody knows about. And that's that's happened a few times. Um, so I think it's it's definitely like giving, giving companies a chance. That said, you also have a generally... Um, uh, a company, a brand is like a good sign of what the soul of a company is. And you can, if they're doing really bad advertising, it's because they really don't have a soul. Um, and, and that's something you learn pretty quickly. As well. Beautifully said. I, I would also say that, you know, I've been in the business for almost 40 years now. So um, looking at the industry, if you're getting into it now, you get to have this conversation for the next 40 years. And I think having the conversation is the important part and not being a jerk about it, but realizing that your job is to sell things. How can you do it in a way that brings value to the person you're doing it for? That's as simple as it is. Yeah. David, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that at agencies I've been at where the companies might not have had the perfect value system, a lot of times we would try to solve business problems and just show them that path. I'll give, I'll give you an example. I worked at an agency that had a tire company. Tire companies are not inherently green in any way. Tires are one of the worst environmental hazards there are in terms of they're hard to dispose of. But the tire company that, that my agency had, and I wasn't there at the time, they did a program in Colorado where they set up roadside stations where they would measure the tread on your tires and make sure you were safe to drive on the icy roads of Colorado. I always thought that was a really smart way of taking a tire company and doing something that shows you care about people. So, uh, absolutely. 
So I, I would just say a lot of times, if you find yourself on accounts that are less than two things, if it's a horrible company, it's a horrible company and get the hell away from it. But if, if the worst thing you can say about them is they're 150 years old and they haven't evolved as quickly as many companies have, um, I'd say they're as interested in seeing the path as, as, as anyone. You just sometimes need to show them a way in sure. that, that, that does feel on, on brand with who they are. And you don't know what seed that might plant in that company. Right. Thomas, you were going to say something. Um, I have been briefed multiple times, as I'm sure everyone else here has, on uh, we, we want to create a movement uh, for our brand. Um, uh, we want to create a movement around uh, yogurt. Uh, and <laughs> we want everyone to, every customer out there to do good in the world and buy yogurt. Um, I, it feels like a little bit of a fool's errand. I'd love for you to discuss your views on that um, that you talk about in the book and, and how that's different from uh, belief, a company belief. I think you've explained it in the question. It's ludicrous. You cannot create a movement. Um, you can only participate and or add to a movement. Um, now, I would argue that State Street uh, participated in a movement very powerfully with Fearless Girl to support girls. But I do think what they did was they took a movement that was happening that seemed important to them trying to drive gender equity on bo in the boardroom uh, and did something that was phenomenally creative that did take part in a movement that made the movement even stronger. But I think what's really important for the, the youngsters getting into the business or people that are young in this business now is think of it as a journey, not a, uh, it's a, it's a journey that I think they get to lead. And I think this is the generation to do it because they care. This generation cares. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in closing, uh, uh, David, um, I think it'd be cool to add some substance to what purpose is yeah. and how to, how, to, uh, how to find it. You had two exercises uh, in, in near the back of your book. Uh, would you care to talk about one was the, uh, the, the eulogy of a brand and the other was the six word test? Yeah. Well, I th the, the great thing, yeah, we all know about six word stories, right? The Hemingway story, uh, for sale, baby shoes, never used. Um, he, he took a challenge that he could write that. I think that that's an important thing to articulate about your own company. Mine is give a damn, it's three words, right? So the discipline of saying and articulating what you are and who you are and everything in a very uh, succinct, powerful phrase is what we do for a living for our, comp for our brands. On the brand eulogy, it's just a very simple exercise to say, what if your company died tomorrow? What would they say? What'd you do? The way what I heard it was, if your company died tomorrow, what would the world miss? Yeah, yeah, what's not there? What, what, would be, what would be the thing you would lament about the passing of the brand and the company? I, just, I love that. It's so cool. It's such, a, such an interesting way of thinking about it. it yeah. It, it's, it's the ultimate deprivation strategy, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It, is. yeah. It, it might be they moved a lot of Funyuns. <laughs> I think if the Funyuns died, the question would be, what would stoners miss? <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, in closing, I, you know, to me, it's like, let's get on the journey. Let's not try to be perfect. So, hey, thank you so much for having me, guys. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, I am really in awe of all your books. Um, I learned so much through this process. But uh, if you want to get any of our books, um, the easiest way is probably to go to Amazon.com. Uh, but uh, also check out your, your local bookstore, support a local bookstore as well.